Okay. Um, so um, let me remind you in the audience that you have your trusty um, index cards to write your questions. And let me, um, I think Vicki will go around collecting them. L let me ask um, the first question to the panel, um, which is this. Um, how has the passage of Obamacare helped or not helped um, situation in schools with regard to public health and the job of school nurses? Um, are, are there clearly um, things that need to be done? Does it differ according to state whether or not they've expanded Medicaid or not? Um, but this has been a, a major um, policy change in the w world of healthcare, and one wonders how it has uh, impacted um, schools and school nurses. Anyone? I'll start that one and then mm -hmm. join in. I'm going to. Um, I'm opportunist, so I'm going to talk about some of the opportunities that it opened up that we've heard about. There's three things that the Affordable Care Act mentioned that really are great opportunities that link in with what school nurses do already. The first one is access to care, and this was, has been mentioned by several on, um, on the committee here that that's one of the things that school nurses do is when they find students that don't have um, either health insurance or just need a need for access to care. First of all, the school nurse is accessed for a lot of care. If they need more specialized care, um, for or more advanced care like from a um, health care provider nurse practitioner, the clinics, they can um, oftentimes link in and it works really well, especially when they're in the same schools, how they work together so well to get them into the school-based clinic or to other um, coverage that they need. So that's one area. Another area is the um, emphasis on prevention and promotion of health and trying to stop things before they happen, the public health side of things that school nurses do all the time. They're the eyes and ears of public health in many ways. They see when things are happening. They work with the families as well and are able to prevent um, and identify ways early on before they get out of hand and often to a, a lot of time of education and teaching. Um, I think the third area though is probably the biggest and that's with managed care. The Affordable Care Act provides opportunities for communities to be and they, and they highlight the emphasis of communities and more health care going into the communities and coordinating care between different um, providers and school nurses are one of those providers. They are already coordinating the care because they've got to talk to the the child, the student's health care provider to know what's going on in regards to what medications are given or what treatments have been ordered. But then it's the nurse that coordinates and translates that into language that educators understand and takes care of it and works with families as well because the goal is to, to empower students and their families to manage their conditions. So school nurses are already in that position as kind of helping coordinate and with funding being, the, um, with the policies allowing funding to not be quite as siloed as it has been in the past. Um, and the a ACO, the, um, I'm going to get the name wrong, it's the Accountable Care Organizations, some of them call them, is that, okay, community care organizations that have been going on, and this is dependent, in, dependent on the, where they're at, but in the states that have started to do those, they are looking at different ways of funding, and that includes how they fund school nurses. Traditionally, about 80% of school nurses are funded through education. A lot of the things we talked about here, it's a return on investment, but not necessarily the return on investment of just for education dollars that are strapped. But um, healthcare systems and healthcare provider or hospitals are actually in public health too have started in some areas. It's um, contracting with educators and actually the employee, the school nurses are actually employees of the healthcare system, and providing still the same services, but then with a link with um, the healthcare systems, also have um, more access sometimes to specialists that they might need, and. It, it actually sometimes will even out the funding so education doesn't have to pay for it all, health will do some. So it's kind of a newer model in some respects, but those are some of the positive ways because then it, puts, it spreads the money so that more school nurses have been able to be hired in several locations, which has helped. And then with reimbursement of Medicaid and how um, that has been affected by Obamacare, there's actually the ability to reimburse some of the services that school nurses perform. So that also helps bring in more money, which could also help increase the number of school nurses and other school health services. So there's some of them. I was just going to say that 
It also um, takes the demand off of the primary care system that with the Affordable Care Act, um, every individual is supposed to have a medical home or a primary care provider. And um, we know that there's not enough primary care providers for every individual in the country. So one thing that having a good um, school health system, uh, having school nurses in the school means that the nurse, because we decrease the number of dismissals, early dismissals, we can keep those kids that don't need to see a primary care provider out of the office and decreasing the demand for care that's not necessary and also keeping kids out of the emergency room that, that don't need to go there. So um, it, it's, it's expanding the health care system and making sure that people are seen in the, in the care pro provider's office who need to be seen. See, I'd like to piggyback a little bit more on back up just to Aaron, um, and I think Martha mentioned it a little bit. I don't know if you're aware, but we do have the right to access some kind of billing process through the Saint Paul or through the school system. I don't know if you're aware of that, right? So not. And let me give you like two two examples. So so Catherine comes into my office to receive her medication every day, right? For and she's on an IEP, so individual educational plan. So I see her every day. She would fall under a special ed, a student that receives that services, right? And then we have another another student that comes in. What's your name, sir? Uh, what is it? Fabian Lee. Fabian Lee comes in for the same thing every day, but he doesn't have an IEP, <laughs> right? What we would call or classify as a regular ed student, right? Do you know that I have the ability to bill out and charge the state for Catherine, but not th this young man over here, right? <laughs> Same student, or no, I'm sorry, same situation, two different kind of categories, right? A student who has an IEP and a student who doesn't. That's a problem. You know, that's not, that's not equity. That's not fair. But I think maybe the Affordable Care Act might be able to do something with that because we're starting to look into other things like non-IEP billing for maybe a student with a chronic disease, asthma, diabetes. But the, the disclaimer is they have to have Medicaid or Medicaid. So if they have health partners, yay, health partners, we, don't, we can't bill out. And I think Martha remembers years ago, we had to submit both students to get denied on, on him, right? Mm -hmm. Just to be able to get, yes. mm -hmm. so now when you talk about workload for no productivity, just extra work to get no result, those are things we need to work out for, you know, an AFT will hit that hard and heavy about how can we go after insurance companies so they can pay the same as our other students. There is for single payer, isn't there? Yes, there is. <laughs> yes, there is. Okay. Oh, and let me introduce Tom had mentioned before Mary Catherine Ricker. Mary Catherine Ricker, who is the executive vice president of the AFT and um, was Tom's president in St. Paul for many years, is, is with us. Um, so he, he, here's an interesting question, um, and, and you know, when the um, elementary, secondary, elementary and secondary education act um, required schools to have highly qualified teachers, um, a problem um, began to arise in terms of the availability of people with those qualifications um, to fill those spots. And so um, the question is, would there be an analogous um, kind of pipeline problem with school nurses? Um, if we require every school to have a school nurse, are we going to have um, an adequate supply um, to fill all those positions? And if not, what do we need to do to, to get to that point? Well, we, we know that when there's a, a school nurse opening, it's typically filled. If a, if a community pays school nurses uh, within the normative range for school nursing, that school position is filled. Um, and school nurses traditionally, once they uh, uh, enter a school health environment, typically stay in that environment throughout the remainder of their career because they're so satisfied with their positions. So um, we do have an issue where, um, just like other 
occupations, um, many nurses are going to be retiring uh, in the next few years because of the baby boomer, ba baby boomers retiring. Uh, but um, I actually think that school nursing is not going to be one of those areas that suffers from shortages because of the, um, the uh, attractiveness of the position uh, and I, I'm very optimistic about it. We, I'm at the University of Illinois Chicago. We run a school nurse certificate program and we have full uh, classes each semester and a lot of interest in going into this subspecialty. So, so the nurses appreciate freedom from oppressive doctors. In their <laughs> we work in partnership with other health care <laughs> providers. <laughs> Um, say, say one, one comment on that? I'm sure. sorry, sorry to monopolize the microphone. Um, when I asked urban nurses why they became a school nurse, that was one of the things, right? The opportunity to work with in pediatrics, which typically my dissertation looked at more males that are urban nurses, the opportunity to work with kids, right? And also the favorable work schedule. And it goes back a little bit to your working environment is important, right? And if you're happy, like the study that uh, Martha shared, right, they loved it. And that matters, right? Happy worker, you know, ha you're productive, right? Oh, look at it. You, you, you mouthed it. So I just wanted to piggyback on that, that. That's what the research that I conducted showed, that it matters, you know, that you want to be there, you're happy with what your working environment, and you're productive and the satisfaction you get, right? Um, so, so this question is directed to Tom, but I think it's something you all might want to address. Um, which is this question of the nurse-student ratio. Um, and the, the question gets at, at it don't, in fact, you need a much more intensive ratio in high poverty schools um, where, where students are not, um, you know, they don't have health insurance and, and all, um, and, and, you know, could you address that question? Yeah, you, yeah, I'd like to respond to. Oh, I was just going to say yes. We absolutely, actually, 100% agree with that. The ratio has been around and was a good beginning point to give kind of a reference, uh, but evidence and what Sherry or I'm sorry, Terry. <laughs> sorry, I knew that. I was going to say school and Terry at the same time. Um, what, what she mentioned about public health and the social determinants, uh, and actually the newest uh, position paper from the National Association of School Nurses indicates the importance that it needs to be a formula and that it includes acuity and severity of the students and their health conditions, but it also needs to take into account the social determinants, the things such as poverty, language barriers, geography, lots of different things need to be part of this formula per se in identifying what is the best coverage um, for students. Yeah, no, I just want to piggyback on that as well because you mentioned the you know, determinants of health, right? And that's one of the five, one of the five subgroups of that is health services, which is access. And it's ironic because um, a couple contracts ago, we were looking at that exact same topic, right? So we knew that poverty was a driving force for all kinds of issues around learning, around access. And we, we went to our district and we said, we want our numbers in these schools even lower, right? So, I mean, 200 kids, 300 kids, even class size, right? If they're struggling, right, academically need you know, more support. Well, we don't want a, a range, because we don't like ranges, of between 25 and 20, you know, 23 and 25. We want actually in, in these really struggling schools, we want like 17 students in there. So you really can dive in and really do small groups and different instruction, right? So we totally were on board with that. You know, like let's let's really work hard, and, and we know the answers. But it goes back to things that I've dealt with for 10 years, which is it's a money issue. Lower numbers or more <coughs> staff equals more money. That's that's the that's the issue. Just like with everything else, money drives it. Okay. Can I, oh, can I yes, go ahead. Okay. So uh, that was an excellent question. And I would pretend that you need both. You need a school-based health center and you need a school nurse, particularly in those communities where you have high degrees of poverty, marginalization, under-resourced schools, and under-resourced communities. I suggest to you that it's a both and. It's not an either or. And so, um, and because the ratio is my question, and I'm sorry I interrupted you, Martha, because um, you had said 996 
nurses, and I think you meant 996 students. So this was the average caseload. In this so study. In this study. So what was the optimal? What's an optimal formula or optimal caseload? There is a complex formula that's yeah. from the National Association of School Nurses right. and the CDC that's uh, 1 to 750 of well students, uh, 1 to 250 of uh, uh, students with chronic conditions, uh, 1, to 125, 1 to 125 students for uh, medically fragile students, and then, of course, students who are one, one to one, uh, for instance, ventilator assisted. Ventilator assisted, mm -hmm. right. Okay. But, but All that right. doesn't include the new part that talks about the social determinants. Right. That's just right. the acuity part. Oh, that's just yeah. the medical right. acuity. Yeah. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's, I just wanted to say that I believe that there's, there's, there's certain communities based on the profile of that community that really optimally should have both. Okay. Um, in Philadelphia, we are fighting a proposal by the school district to privatize school nurse nurses, to subcontract to private companies rather than have school nervous, school, excuse me, school nurses as employees of the district. We are opposing this proposal as we believe that school nurses deserve to be paid a fair wage and have good benefits and should be an integral part of the school community. But what are the thoughts of the panel about efforts to privatize school nurses? I, well, I guess I would I'd be very leery. I mean, we've pushed for so many years to include our nurses who work in the school environment into our contract, just like counselors, social workers, licensed staff are in our contract. They work the same day, they work the same time you know, frame. We had an issue around this probably eight or 10 years ago with uh, Maria Karstarfen, um, <laughs> and she's from here, I think. <laughs> and that was her push. Why are we spending educational money on health, right? I mean, and we were like, because this is the right thing to do. I think, right, I think if there was some gr grandiose idea and someone was able to fund it, our, pr our concern always is when whatever that group who decides to support this movement backs out, now we have no one. So we, we bring in, say, Ramsey County where we live, and they said they're going to fund it through their public health. And then Ramsey County two years later says, you know, we just we don't want to do it anymore. It's too much work. It's too difficult. That's our concern. And I think the underlying issue is the relationships that you build with kids is huge every day. So we don't want to modify a day or they come in once a year or they come in once a week or they come in twice a week. I mean, come on. It's the everyday interaction that you have with kids as a nurse that builds the continuity of care and then they perform better. That's it. So ratios, with all due respect to my panel, I don't agree with them. We have to have kids, or I'm sorry, nurses where there's kids everywhere. And I'm, I'm sorry if you're in a school that's affluent and has everything. You get, maybe they can do more. They can do health fairs and they can do different angles. They can do things differently. And matter of fact, you mentioned the ratio. I have 2,040 kids at my school. Mm -hmm. So give me whatever you said, <laughs> one and a half. <laughs> um, free and reduced lunch, 80%. ELL students, 40%. Special ed, 30%. So, you know, is it right for me to say, let me have another nurse when we have schools who don't have a nurse? No, I would never do that. I would say absolutely not. I'll just work our 70 or 80 hours a week that Martha knows from another study that when we ask nurses, they complete all their work, but they work like crazy. So I would, I would, will you, anybody else? Go I would suggest that, um, that school nurses being a part of education or the school district is very, very strategic around issues like HIPAA and FERPA. And so I would argue that to optimize the services and optimize the outcomes, you need them to be a part of the school district as opposed to an outside contracted entity, unless it's a health entity, um, which we have here in D.C. And so, um, <clears throat> but to have it as a private company, and I'm, I don't, you know, I, it would certainly take more anal analysis to get down into the details, because that's where the devil is, right, in the details. But on the surface, because they're part of the school district, in most cases, not all, there's some significant advantages to that around information that can be easily shared between teachers and school nurses that would have difficulty possibly if it was an outside non-school district entity. 
Okay. So that's just Good. my two cents on that. Um, and I come from the perspective when I was a school nurse, I did I was hired by education, so I understand that system. But I worked as a state consultant, and uh, many of the school nurses were hired through public health and contracted to um, education, and that system worked well for them. Mm -hmm. They were mostly rural areas, and it was the way to get nurses there. Uh, I think the important things are to look at some of the aspects that have been talked about. I don't know about private, what that's referring to. The data shows that, that you can have effective outcomes with other models. For example, school nurses, c like here in D.C., contracted through public health in the hospitals that are providing care in the schools. I think the important thing is how the contracts are written. That has that's been my experience. Exactly. And making sure in those contracts that mm -hmm. um, the school nurses are there and working and the full time, hopefully, uh, that they have that they are part of the school team. That just because their employer might be different, that they still have the um, the interaction with both the school and parents and students, and that certain things are in place. Um, I think that in the healthcare world, we know that they exist across the nation that way. Um, when working through other with healthcare people, and that there's a contract. So I'm not going to surprise anybody by saying I want to see the data. Um, you know, we actually don't know the difference in the different healthcare delivery systems on the outcomes for health and education. So I, you know, we know that Philadelphia is looking at this other model. Um, uh, Aaron and uh, as Terry said here in the um, uh, yes. District of Columbia uh, National Children's Medical Center. Um, coordinates the school health that's delivered here in, in the district. Uh, and we're aware of Akron, Ohio, and um, Austin, Texas, which are also um, school health is coordinated, school health services is coordinated through the children's hospitals there. And um, at this point in time, we don't have um, studies that have compared those different delivery models on outcomes. And from what I understand, that's not the partnership that they're looking at in Philadelphia with a children's hospital? Um. Yeah, I, so I think that that type of contract, um, outsourcing of school health compared to um, being employees of the school system and employees of public health, employees of um, major children's hospitals, I think that that's all questions that need to be answered. Okay. Um, so um, let me ask one last, which is really a series of questions, but they're related. So. Um, um, how do we convince legislatures of the need for um, school nurses and school-based clinics? Um, we have the data, but how do we get a message that resonates? Um, how do we get um, data on socioeconomic benefits of school-based health care out to the press and policymakers? And what can we do as school nurses and as a union that represents school nurses to get families to understand how important immunization is? <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to dive in at one of them, though. Um, Martha had a slide up there, I believe, that talked about part of the study that looked at health office visits early dismissals, medication, and parent-staff communication. The key to that is goes back to the other study that mirrored lost work time for non-staff. Mm -hmm. We have to get them differently, hit them from a different angle and educate them because they don't know. But when you, when they, when I say something like this, I, I tentatively wrote down some numbers. I see uh, 60 kids a day and I average, I do random studies all the time just to pick a day here and there through the years. I almost always am around 60 kids a day. So do the math, it's 240 kids a week, you know, over two th or over 1,000, it's like 14,000 visits a year that come in. And that's if I'm writing them all down, right? Because <laughs> sometimes I don't. That, th that day I do it that week. But you know what? No one cares how many people I see. They don't care how busy I am. They don't care how many people I talk to. What they care about is, is the workload that we can decrease from our workers. That's, that's the angle, I think. We're more efficient, right? I have this slide up there, we're more efficient. We provide you know, an opportunity for other people to do their job. So it's the opportunity gap that we can work on, right? We can decrease the gap because we're there 
and you can teach. They brought a, a girl came down the other day and she broke her, she actually had broke her, fractured her foot. She came with the teacher. Immediately I said, go ahead, I'll take care of it. It was about two hours, right? By the time we put in the ice bucket right away, I knew it was broke. Called the parent three times, three different numbers. They can't come from work. Now we have a 56% of our students are Hmong. So dad and I kind of fought through, well, he came two and a half hours later, but you know what was funny it was the next day, it had nothing to do with Chia. It had to do with the teacher who said, Tom, if you wouldn't have been there, I would have, it would have taken me two, three hours and who would have covered my class. So she was happy because she could turn it over to a professional who then communicated with everybody, got to the referral, went to the doctor, she came back two days later with a walk-in boot, just like yours. <laughs> so I think we have to hit that different angle of, it's not a productivity, it's, it's, this is what our kids need because decreased workload for our teachers you know, equals decreasing the gap between education and healthy learning. So I, I'll piggyback on that and say I think it's really essential for school nurses and for other stakeholders to know the data about what school health can do and the outcomes that you can expect from it. So we need to do a better job of making sure that those messages get out and that school nurses are confident when they share that information. Um, we need to mobilize our stakeholders, especially our parents, as to um, why, you know, what services we're providing and when there is a risk to cuts in school nursing services that uh, the parents are involved in advocating for school health. Um, in terms of immunizations, it, it really hits home with me. Um, I've got two uh, four-year-old twin grandsons out in LA who uh, will be going to an elementary school that has a 24% uh, immunization, fully immunization rate, which is lower than um, Sudan. And uh, I, I am, I'm concerned as a grandparent, and uh, I think that right now there's research going on that is helping us understand the messages that really work to have parents um, understand immunization and understand what it, what it does, not only for their own child, but for, for all children. Mm -hmm. um, so we're working hard to establish those messages and understand what parents' anxieties are um, but um, trying to counteract that with, um, with um, how it's going to protect their child and the public. Um, and you asked how to get the message out. Well, thank you very much for providing this opportunity today to share this information with, with um, uh, our stakeholders here at AFT and across the country. I just want to piggyback, too, is um, in agreement with everything said, and I think it's also asking the other people, the educators. I think I come from a family. I have two sisters that are both high school educators, and we love to talk because coming from a school nursing perspective, we can sometimes use the same language and mean completely different things. Um, one example, this didn't happen personally with me, but I heard of a, a school nurse that came in very concerned talking to a principal because a student was cutting. And she was very concerned and was asking they needed this additional help. And he's like, well, yeah, OK, that's fine. But or, or maybe we should just give him detention or something. And the nurse left thinking how cold the principal was. Well, the nurse was talking about cutting like themselves physically. Not the principal class. thought they were but talking yeah. about cutting <laughs> class. So cutting you can class. see the language yes. and how they've gone in two different directions. Yeah. And I, I think it's important to realize that we see things from a different perspective. Yeah. And it's a different language in many ways. And we look at, we talk about being culturally sensitive, but that uh, there's a culture of education and there's a <coughs> culture of health and our goals are sometimes, they're, they're congruent, but slightly different. And I think it's important. And there have been some qualitative studies when they've asked, for example, principals and teachers and parents uh, their perspective on things and there's, they're very enlightening so I think it's it's using the data but it's also making sure it's being used in a way that people understand and is important for them because that's that's I think where we'll get that there. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah I'd like to uh -huh. so a couple of things first of all unfortunately in our country children are at the bottom of the list of being a priority they don't vote they don't have any money they don't have any power and so we have to rely on the adults in their lives to be to carry their message and be their advocates. So it means that we have to mobilize those adults and we have to empower them as well as in, um, uh, uh, compel them to, to be the messengers on behalf of whether it be their own child or children at large 
and that is the tall order here. And I think that for those parents who benefit from having a school nurse or an or a school based health center, they're the the strong the ones who can really, really carry their message. When it comes and then for adolescents, they are very powerful messengers and have changed the minds of politicians when who were naysayers around school based health centers in my former community where they were naysayers of school based health centers, a politician right who was no longer in Congress but was in Congress who was absolutely a no on it on a school based health center in this particular community and it was uh, at the adolescents who you it was a high school based school based health center. The adolescents and the parents, when he came to visit, after saying no to visiting four times and being embarrassed by his staffer who said, you can't say no again, he finally went, went in as a naysayer, came out as a believer when he saw that school-based health center. And the parents and the students talked to him about it, the value of it, and how it's changed their lives. You can change that perspective, but they have to carry their own message. We can't because we appear to be self-serving, and it's our jobs. And so we can't do it, but they can. So we have to be the ones to enlist adolescents who can, who can be very effective ad, um, advocates and the parents where they are involved particularly for the younger children in elementary school because we know we get more parents in elementary school than we do more parental involvement involvement in elementary school than we do in high school so so uh for parents in elementary school and, and um and, you know really if you have to uh, beg, borrow, steal to get them to be able to write a letter, to communicate their sentiments, to go and visit their congressmen, to be a part of the school community and be able to be a part of a tour for a congressman, which is what happened with, with actually it was Congressman Mike Rogers, to be honest with you, who is no longer there anymore, but who turned around. He, it was the parents and it was the students who did it for him. So. On that, that's what drove our contract. That's what drove our contract last to get to ratification was the community involvement, right? Three to four. I'll probably be wrong on the exact numbers, but starting off with three to four thousand signatures to the school board to say this is what's important, right? And then ramping it up and being strategic from a union standpoint. And then moving for walk-ins and being in Minnesota, I don't know if you know what a walk-in is, but you instead of walking out because it's negative, you walk in with students, right? But it was snowing, it was a storm, and we still had 3,000 members outside every school in St. Paul, and it was awesome. And then also informational picketing, and then a strike vote. This is how important it is for our members that our kids have a nurse, a social worker, a counselor, smaller class sizes, decrease in these high-stakes testing, right? But the families were behind us. Yeah. And you, you said something, too, that was resonating with me even more. The student. Yeah. So when the student goes to the school board and says, you know what? Right. I don't have a desk. Right. And I'm in an right. IB class or advanced placement class, and I'm sitting over in the corner writing on the w windowsill. And she says, you know, teachers make pretty good money, 70000 a year. But you guys make double, and you don't have interaction with kids. We can't have that impact. That came from a student. That was powerful. And that's why when 98% of our members voted to strike, two days later we settled with everything everything we wanted. Because we... Very powerful. Yep. Very, very powerful. So thanks for reminding that. So um, let me just say that um, as a union of both educational professionals and healthcare professionals, um, we in the American Federation of Teachers understand that both public education and public health care are important precisely because education and health care are public goods. Um, that they provide um, for the community and that they provide um, in a way in which um, an injury to one um, is an injury to all. And, and that was the um, reasoning um, behind having this panel and um, the particular importance of um, the school nurse, which is um, at the intersection of these two public goods of education and healthcare. 
So let me um, thank all the members of the panel for a, um, I think, very uh, informative panel. And let me thank all the audience um, for being here today.